Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another thorough book review where I'm going to be highlighting just one book, Empire of Silence by Christopher Rauchio, Ruccio, Christopher Ritchie. Uh, and uh, this is going to be in the format we've been doing a little bit recently here for book reviews where there's a spoiler-free section uh, that I record about halfway down the book. That's where I am right now. A spoiler-free section uh, once I finish the book, so it's kind of a juxtaposition of first impressions versus concluding thoughts, and then a spoiler-filled section at the end. And some people seem to think if I take a book like this and highlight it for a full book review on its own, not in the monthly reading wrap-up, uh, that means that the book is like the best of the best. That's not necessarily the case. It just means I have the most to say about it. And you know, some authors might actually be like, oh, that is what I want. I don't want someone to just adore my book. I want someone to find like a lot of things to discuss about it. Empire of Silence falls into that category in a massive way. I have problems with this book. I'm also in love with it. Um, it's, it's a love-hate relationship in a way that uh, I think many authors should aspire to evoke from their readers because the best of science fiction, the best of fantasy, the best of literature, challenges you. And I think that's where Empire of Silence uh, is kind of kicking off from. And I'm, I'm really interested in it for having a protagonist that I don't necessarily love, but that is intentional. And a setting that is clearly inspired from some books Christopher uh, Ricky is a fan of, but at the same time is doing a lot on its own that is uh, evolving the genres in some modern ways. So I'm a big fan of all of that, but before we get into this kind of chiller discussion, I'm gonna make this a little more calm, more podcasty type video if you don't mind. One, because I wanna experiment with that on the channel, and two, I currently have a pinched nerve in my neck, uh, so I'm not in the mood to do a whole bunch of arm wavy flail and stuff. Pain in the neck, you know? I think I do need to turn this side light down a little bit, but for this video, we'll keep it. It's it's an epic sci-fi one. Dramatic lighting is, is appropriate. What is Empire of Silence so far? I am almost exactly at the halfway point, and this is a story that is clearly born out of a love for Dune, first and foremost above anything else. I would say there's also tinges of like Red Rising overtly in the setting, but there's tons of literary references to all kinds of classic stories in here as well. It's one of those things where you can tell uh, to varying degrees of success, the author really wanted to layer in and fold all kinds of details to the story that you could just bury yourself into and discuss and discuss and discuss. Hence the existence of this video. That's why we're here. Sun Eater is set in the far distant future of Earth. So far in the future that humanity has left Earth and it's kind of like a myth. It's actually a planet they are no longer, as far as I'm aware where I am in the book, existing on. There is this expansive empire of humanity at war with some aliens that aren't super relevant to the narrative yet. And we follow in this setting uh, the son of a very important noble. Hence the Dune comparisons. We must have a look at Paul Atreides. They are not something that is only gonna come through this setting though, but also exist uh, due to characterization, due to certain executions of the story, though it is written in first person, so expect it narratively to be far different in that presentation uh, angle. But this protagonist who we follow in first person, Hadrian, isn't meant to be super lovable right away, I don't think. Uh, the presentation style of the story, uh, I guess if I want to pull from like the most common popular example people will get is almost Dresden File-esque, uh, where we are directly getting someone telling us their story in the past. Uh, the Dresden Files, at least in my head, have always kind of felt like, oh, it's someone going through their case files and like telling you the story on like the meta angle. Uh, here in the opening, even more overtly, this is someone saying like, I'm here to tell you my epic story. Do a really nice narrative device that I'm almost always a fan of, unless it's completely fumbled, of saying like, I'm a huge deal now. Let's go figure out how I got here. I'm very important. Uh, I have many leather bound books. I think that's always kind of enticing, right? Like it's cool to like be sitting across in the equivalent of a historical figure and feel like they're about to uh, spin you a yarn of how this whole world came to be. And the stakes are set super high because Sun Eater? It doesn't seem to be an exaggeration from what we are told. To my surprise, I thought that was just gonna be like evocative imagery, but there is a sun that is apparently gone. Don't know how that happens yet, but goddamn. And this character, Hadrian, takes us back into his teen life when he is living with a very abusive father and a distant mother and just a, an asshole of a brother uh, named Christopher. I think it's Christopher, something like sounds like that. 
Not Christopher. That's the name. That's the author's name, Daniel, you idiot. I know what I'm doing. Crispin. I wasn't too far off, actually. A little in the ballpark there. And being a teenager, he's rebelling against this family. And for the most part of the first chunk of the book, I was really on his side. But the usage of first person is really interesting in Empire of Silence because at first I was just thinking like, oh, everyone around Hadrian is the worst. But then you kind of realize, yeah, he was raised by these people and Hadrian kind of sucks. Uh, in a live stream, I, I briefly tuned in and out of, of uh, Christopher Ruccio talking about his books because I didn't want to get spoiled. He compares them to like uh, Attack, on, Attack of Clones, Anakin, which I actually think is a decent comparison. I think he is someone who does have genuine problems. Like his dad is abusive. His brother is a monster. He threatens sexual <laughs> someone at some point. Like they, his family sucks. Hadrian just also kind of sucks, but he is the person we're following. And through a series of events that happen that I'm not going to spoil, um, he gets put in a very dire situation. And I believe uh, presentation style as of now, we are going to see him uh, go from being somewhat of a spoiled child who's having to deal with some terrible things uh, to someone who is incredibly driven to bulk against the system that his family is a part of. I mean, that's kind of the clear setup we're gonna go with here. It is very Dune, it is a little Red Rising. Hi, future Daniel here who's finished the book, giving this one last pass through edit. It's fun to go back and see how both right and wrong I was. Take that as you will. But uh, I like the approach and the uh, style of this a bit more. I really like how Emperor Pyre of Silence is kind of embracing this and it's doing so by turning up the dislike of the main character, but also poisoning the atmosphere of everyone around him and just being so emotionless, so egotistical, uh, so driven about power and almost nothing else. He's given some acts of kindness. There is a Tudor character, uh, which I always love, a nice Tudor character who is supposed to win you over, uh, Gibbons, Gibson. You can't remember the name. Who on a surface level is the most human, the most fatherly to Hadrian, but on a deeper level, uh, I think is providing another view of the situation of the world, of the reality of Hadrian's situation. That's one of the beautiful angles of Christopher's writings here, where he was smart enough to utilize first person to be a, not like totally unreliable narrator, but an unreliable perspective on some elements of the world, but also then tactfully weave in bits of information that if you're as a reader or paying attention, highlight, uh, emphasize just how unreliable Hadrian's perspective can be. Now, while Hadrian is the smaller brother, he is the older brother. Uh, Crispin is larger than him. Uh, he is the more brute, a little more of a, a not himbo, but of that kind of like dumb, powerful guy vibe. And uh, Hadrian, I would say, yeah, is more of that like snotty Anakin, but he's really smart and he speaks. So there was even one line where he says like, I'm not one for poetry. And I was like, <laughs> really? And the initial conflict really starts to focus on Hadrian's uh, bulking against his father, not wanting to go down the path his father wants. And in some ways being a more idealistic leader than his father, but that just comes down to the fact that while Hadrian isn't my favorite person, he's clearly a better person than his father. Those clashes between him and dear old daddy continue to escalate to the point where the uh, question of succession is brought into play, where yeah, he might be the older brother, but his dad has never named him as an heir. I'm afraid I have bad news. And so Hadrian sees a future ahead of him where he knows, okay, one, I don't necessarily wanna rule, but I hate the idea of my brother ruling. And on top of that, what's my father gonna do to me if he decides that the best course of action isn't for me to be his heir? Am I gonna be forced to be uh, a priest equivalent for uh, this religion that the empire utilizes that's known bullshit, like it's just something to keep the people in line? Or am I gonna be like sent to the front lines? He, he just doesn't know where he's gonna end up. And so he wants to find another path. He makes a series of choices and that's where the difference between education and I guess street smarts or space street smarts really start to screw over Hadrian because he steps out of his bubble first with like a small way and he gets punished for it big time. And then he starts to try and break from his bubble. And then he not only starts paying the price, but other people who are trying to help him end up uh, really paying that price. And that's where that theme of Hadrian learning of trying to grow and actually becoming a capable leader comes into play because his father, every single time he gets mad at Hadrian, it's not for a reason that feels stupid or contrived. His father has a way of rule, an image to maintain over billions of people. And if even a crack is put in that, it could spark 
horrendous rebellion and bloodshed. And so, yeah, his father's a tyrant, but you get why a tyrant behaves the way they do. They operate on fear, and Hadrian just doesn't want to operate that way. And that might be idealistic of him. You can't really be a tyrant without fear. As someone who didn't love the presentation of Dune and, and only really fell in love with that series and its sequels, this was kind of more of that early play emotionally and family-wise. I would be uh, hoping to be at the forefront of that story. I'm not going to say it's like my favorite read of the year, but in terms of one that I could sit down with my audience and make a video like this about, it's going to be up there because it's something that understands you can have a good person, but you can make them extremely flawed and good people make bad decisions. Good people get people hurt. The only real difference, the only expectation we have as a reader that we're looking for from a protagonist who's going to make mistakes and get other people hurt is that they learn lessons and they grow from there. And as uh, Hadrian is thrown into parts of his society that he is not ready to deal with, that he sticks out like a sore thumb while he's in, uh, well, as he meets people that are genuinely good for the first time and watches those people suffer as a part of the society he's a part of, it's like this assurance to us as the reader that he's either going to go down a very good path or a very dark path. He says there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so in response to that. And that's this great narrative tension where I'm constantly watching Hadrian like a hawk, like, okay, is this exposure to the reality of the system you were a part of uh, going to send you down column A or column B? Oh, <laughs> something just happened. We just we just got, uh, I thought the biggest emotional twist of the first chunk of the book would be keeping it spoiler free when, when start stealing rings, uh, but it, it really comes into play when there's actually a plague uh, that starts hitting the society heavy on the planet Hadrian ends up on. And I, at this point, I was like, okay, I gotta record right now. I was like, I gotta get my thoughts down because while this had that kind of detached political dune angle that I, I can appreciate absolutely in terms of the political side, uh, where you're hearing all these idealistic or like ideological clashes going on. Empire of Silence then left turned hard into a more personal emotional connection to the ramifications of those ideological differences. It's special, like there's something special about this book. I'm really digging it. I'm not saying it's like a 10 out of 10. I think the way the narrative pushes forward and progresses at times is a bit clunky. Uh, I'm hoping to see that improve in sequels, but the pros, Pretty damn strong. Uh, I, I like the choice of language from this character, especially because it does feel distinctly from this character, and it simultaneously adds a flavor to the to the reading experience that feels extra. That that feels like yeah, you're following kind of this pompous noble. I, even at one time, I was thinking of the uh, the noble from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, who's like yearning out the window, and I was kind of laughing like it's it's him meets Anakin, grimdark. <laughs> one day, lad. All this will be yours. What, the curtains? No, not the curtains, lad. But all right, let's go ahead and cut to when I have finished Empire of Silence. Three, two, one. Before we get into the rest of the serious review here, though, I need to send a quick message and warning to my audience here, because I don't know if the author, Crispin Ritchie, understands what he's doing, the forces he's playing with, but let's break down what exactly Empire of Silence has delivered in terms of Ooh. appeal, because within this futuristic sci-fi world, we have people who can age to be hundreds of years old, yet still be looking in the prime of their life. That's right, you can be certain serving MILF or DILF energy, and maintain the physique of Xena Princess Warrior or Brad Pitt from Fight Club. The cast of characters includes a badass, technologically enhanced witch character from Off World, who of course is breaking all the rules, an evil, physically superior younger brother, who of course has a dangerous edge, toss in a few himbo-esque gladiators, who of course are fighting in the arena as underdogs and training, bonding, and just working out together, all orbiting around a character who himself descends from an unattainably high dreamlike status in the world, but he becomes aware of his privilege and is learning the true lessons of life and the conditions of the average man in the world around him. He goes through a series of growth points that make Hadrian himself just mwah, oh, spectacular, falls in love, but has his heart broken, always going from a whiny Anakin to a tragic sad boy, descending down into his own path of rebellion, finding himself, of course, amongst nobles who are sculpted to genetic perfection due to the technology that they're heir arrogant selves use, existing in a culture that takes the romanticized version of how we view, like, ancient world sexualization minus the actual problematic sh that was there. Not like that. But never supplying 
an official release and instead continually teasing Crispin Ritchie, if your story is ever adapted to the silver screen, if this space epic is ever brought down to an artist's lens, your story will hit the bi community with the exact same energy as The Mummy did in the early 2000s. I don't know if we as a society are ready to handle that. Are you aware of what you are doing, sir? You wrote a great story. I'm hooked. I'm going to binge the rest of Sun Eater immediately. My TBR is now knocked over and instead it's just the remainder of your books. But you have done me the honor and or disservice of adding in this tremendous amount of sexual energy and tension that I don't know if you're even aware is there. My God. If we ever get a Sun Eater HBO series, a whole new generation of people is gonna realize they're bi overnight. Congratulations. I guess all we can do is get back into the rest of the serious part of I finished the book review. Can you tell I liked it? I'm not just applauding the book. That's so I can sync up my audio. A little bit of behind the scenes there. But yes, I just finished Empire of Silence, book one in the Sun Eater series. And God damn, dude, God damn, dude, I had such a good time with this book. I need to get through the spoiler free section of me talking about the reading experience of the whole book before I get into the spoiler filled section. But this might be the first time that the spoiler filled section is the longest part of the video because I have so much to say. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go ahead and talk uh, spoiler free stuff for Crispin Ritchie's Sun Eater. Uh, Empire of Silence, the book one. That's how humans say that sentence normally. I hope people don't mind the nicknames I give them, especially authors. Most of them I've talked to have been like, yeah, that's fine. I don't really care. But I don't know, Crispin Ritchie. I like that one. I feel like that's good. It brings in like his character and it makes fun of the fact that my dyslexic ass couldn't say the last chunk of his name. I don't know. I'm always a little bit worried. You can make nicknames about my name all you want. I encourage everybody to do that. Though most people just go with Goblin. So that's, I like that too. That's a good one. I, being called Goblin, it's, it, let's talk about the book actually. If there was like one condensed thought I could bring down my opinion on Empire of Silence to, it would be Flash with actual substance. Because with how this book presents itself, it's quite flashy, for lack of a better way to put it. And a lot of big epic sci-fi and fantasy books attempt to do this. They have a more purple or a more distinct approach to their prose. They're more indulgent with their pacing. They spend quite a bit of time giving you wider information about the world. But you as the reader are kind of taking on faith that it'll be worth, you know, a bit of a slower pace, uh, a bit of a more uh, indulgent on the author's behalf experience for the actual writing of what you're reading. Don't waste my time, man! And there's been so many times in my career where I've gotten to the end of a book that has asked so much of my time, and I feel like it is not actually delivered. It's not taken any of those things it took the time to build and for me to experience, and then brought them back into the text in a meaningful way, or even utilized them in a way that felt interesting to just support the narrative. What Christopher has built here is something with tremendous depth that you can just dive into as a reader head first and not worry that you're gonna just hit a concrete bottom. But nearly all of it was folded back into the story that's being told in a meaningful way, if not directly affecting the narrative, indirectly supporting an aspect of the culture or the characterization going on to have meaning within the broader vision. And the few things that didn't feel like they tied in directly to this story absolutely feel like, okay, next book or maybe the book after, definitely going to be played in because this doesn't feel like an amateur who's just throwing hands left and right because they might make contact as a writer. There is so much thought that is going into uh, how this book proceeds and it has that special feeling where it's like, okay, this isn't just a little nice tune of a story. This is one of those symphonies. And I like this book this much and all of the Sun Eater fans have been commenting that it just gets better from here. And I'm so tired of fantasy series being recommended to me where people are like, yeah, get through book one and book two, maybe book three. Book four, though, that one's not great either. Book five is actually awesome. <laughs> and instead, Sun Eater fans are like, I know the first one's really good. Everything from there 
even better. And I need a bathroom, amen. That is not to say um, Empire of Silence is flawless. I would say there are times where the narrative feels a bit jumpy, which uh, may seem contradictory to what I just said because it is rather indulgent with how much time we are spending in certain scenes and aspects of the world that are being built out. But at various points, the narrative just kind of sprints forward in a way that I feel like could have benefited from some more time getting Hadrian, our main character, from point A to B. As I said, spoiler-free section, but I'm willing to say the setup of a story in a spoiler-free section. It's a very Paul Atreides start. He's someone who is high up in society, and we see him descend down, and within this book, he's kind of fighting his way back up in unorthodox manners, which provides us this extremely dynamic view of the world within Sun Eater. I absolutely love that, this empire. It feels like one of the personality empires of science fiction for me. Like I get such a distinct flavor of like what it would be like to live here. I think that's largely due to Hadrian's bouncing around here within positions of society. But that bouncing around did give me a little bit of whiplash at two specific points. Combine that with a pacing of the book that does kind of after that stumble slow way down. If you're someone who needs really consistent pacing or just efficient pacing, Maybe Empire of Silence wouldn't be for you, though I think there's a lot of other elements that could make up for that here. I'm just reminded of like the joke from Naked Gun where like the beautiful woman is walking down the stairs and then she like falls and then gets back up and is like very graceful again. <laughs> and perhaps if you are the type of reader who wants everything like cranked to an 11, if you want every conflict to reach that maximum amount of action, maybe you could be a little bit disappointed here too because that's not the story that's attempting to be told. Instead, the story of Sun Eater, at least in Empire of Silence for me. It is the downfall of someone who's a bit of a twit. Uh, Hadrian, with the start of the story, he does, as I said in the earlier part of the video, have that Attack of the Clones, Anakin energy, but he is then grounded. He is then put through the ringer, and the amount of growth he goes through just here. You feel like the Hadrian at the end of Empire of Silence would want to punch the Hadrian at the beginning, and a good chunk of the growth he has left to do is realizing just how much he would probably have hated himself back then because he's still got a bit of an ego. Look at me, I'm the great. But I like how much conflict is put on his shoulders internally and externally. Hadrian is fighting battles, but there's this internal turmoil that makes him so compelling as a protagonist that as he is growing, he's kind of shifting and maneuvering within his own mind to these new conclusions that we as the reader are always just appropriately ahead of him within the text to know where he's gonna go and kind of be rooting for him to go through that growth. And he's never so vile at the beginning that you just wanna see him fail, especially because he is just brought up in such abuse and such trauma that yeah, he can be a flawed protagonist, a very flawed one, but you're still going to be like, I wanna see this guy succeed because everyone around him sucks so much harder. Fuck you, fuck you and fuck you. Who's next? As you've probably picked up uh, just from the Hadrian naming, uh, there's a lot of Roman influence here. There's a lot of that ancient world coming into play, but it's not just on the aesthetics level. Like Red Rising is a, is a very apt comparison. Red Rising's got kind of that like ancient world in space mentality. But Sun Eater is really about getting into not only the aesthetics of the ancient world, but also folding in like some ideas from classic literature that I don't want to spoil and parallels along those lines where it's like, oh, the better red you are, I feel like the more you'll be able to like kind of get into Sun Eater, get into what uh, the author is trying to retell or explore. And then it actually even plays into like themes that are being developed, I, I believe at least, in the background of the story. But let's get into that like parallelism a little bit because we have an empire that is clearly supposed to be very based off of uh, ancient Rome, ancient Greece type influence. And what's interesting is some of the other factions at play, I believe on my reading of it, I haven't looked into what the author has said about this or what the consensus is in the readers, are actually being based off of the other empires that were warring at this time. And so you kind of get this historical retelling, this cyclical nature that I dig because Earth is still in the past and it's very reminiscent as I'm currently rewatching Battlestar Galactica of being like, oh, the ancients versus how we are now and these conflicts coming back into play, but they're not supposed to be like one to ones. It's not like the literal like wheel of time situation, but I still like how that history in the future thing is being 
fully fleshed out. But when you get into that kind of future world folded back into an ancient one, there's kind of this disconnect in your head where I'm like, hey, shouldn't we have progressed to like a Star Trek-like society? Like, why aren't we there? And why are we seeming to regress? That's kind of directly addressed in Sun Eater, where there are these gargantuan territories that need to be dominated. And there's this idea, this philosophy put forth that to be able to run something on that scale, you need to have kind of an authoritarian approach, which of course I don't agree with, but it then justifies this whole ideology that's bled throughout the populace where the people, the average like peasants are kept so down. They are not allowed access to tech. They are not allowed to be educated in the same way. And so it's like justified in the world building and then kind of plays into why there's like gladiator fights again. Uh, and you see this societal regression, but it's regressing back to a society, to a civilization that even today, we still kind of like fetishize in our heads. Like we still romanticize ancient Rome and ancient Greece, even like the Persian empire so much, which is a level of thought I have felt to be missing in first books uh, for series that have attempted similar things before. Usually like most get there eventually, uh, but man, I really enjoyed as like a Robert Jordan fan, how much time and effort is put into just like justifying the existence of this society so that you as the reader can kind of sit back and let the story begin to fly by. And the actual like emperor, the actual ruler, the establishment by extension of this emperor uh, laying over this entire empire is also extremely effective and Crispin she did a good job of justifying it with tech. Cameras are watching everyone, always. And so as Hadrian continues to grow and new ideas that are quite dangerous are brought into play in the narrative, how they are even able to be talked about is tension inducing. And ooh, I'm a fan. I like that, Drew. I like that a lot. So that's the big picture, right? Now let's focus down to like the smaller picture because the aesthetics on the smaller scale, mwah! Yes, very gladiator, very Roman, totally succeeds there. But bringing in that like future tech I talked about in my little rant earlier where like people are aging all the way, it cements the noble class into being something that feels like they kind of have come back into that belief that did exist in ancient civilization that like the rulers were superior, they were something better than, because they literally are now. They are genetically modified. They use that to make themselves actually just the best. Hadrian's considered like short for his family, and I think he's six four. The noble class actually towers over everybody else, which of course then justifies like the selective breeding within nobles to come back into play in arranged marriages. Cause like, oh, you have those best genetically modified genes. I have these best genetically. Let's have our kids get together. But in a society that is so dependent on this rigid structure, the one real threat and the nobles are aware of this to their position is tech and the average everyday people getting access to it or people who already have resources being willing to like modify themselves beyond genetics and start getting like cybernetic implants, which really does set Sun Eater apart from many of its sci-fi peers. Because yeah, there's there's been sci-fi stories that have said like, oh, people who get like technological modifications that's more, don't do that bad. But it's tying it into this, this already existing world. And then a character we meet who is violating that rule uh, is kind of thought of as like a witch and their powers are treated as if it's like magic. Ooh. In one book, just one-to-one -one book, I cannot think of another sci-fi book that has set up an ancient world in the future as well as Empire of Silence did. And there are so many references, I believe, maybe I'm reading too much into them, to ancient stories as well with like characters jumping forward in time, but in like a sci-fi way and things along those lines where I just, I wanna reread it. And the only reason I'm not is because I wanna continue on in the series. If there, if book two wasn't out right now, I would be rereading book one immediately. But because there are several books in the series available, I'm like, I wanna, but I gotta. Must be frustrating for you. Unanswered questions that I understand why they're not unanswered. They're not just loose strings dangling in the wind, but they are set up to compel me further in the future. I love Sun Eater. I mean, if you read this and you don't wanna read the next book, 
Hey, maybe we just have very different tastes, but that's all right. You can still follow me here and you just know that if I love something that probably shouldn't be high up on your TBR or if I hate it, maybe it should. That's overgeneralizing. But without too much further ado, I'm going to go ahead and say I am giving Empire of Silence a 9 out of 10. Before we get into the spoiler filled section, I do also just want to say thank you everyone so much for making the latest merch drop launch uh, such a smash success. Apparently this is just y'all's favorite designs we have ever done. So if you would like to go ahead and check out uh, like things like the Give Women Swords shirt or the Disheveled Goblin Tee. Links, of course, uh, should just be right below the video. It's been our best merch launch yet, so mwah, appreciate y'all. But now let's go ahead and get into the spoiler filled section because I, I want to like just go through this entire story. Now I've only read the book once, so if I get anything wrong, uh, Sun Eater fans, kindly correct me in the comments down below. But okay, just walking through this delicious story, we start with Hadrian uh, in amongst his sh family who suck uh, and maybe his mom isn't the worst but with the childhood Hadrian had I don't want to get like blinders on and be like oh she kind of saved him at the end there so maybe she's great she's not great uh, she did the bare minimum <laughs> I understand she's in a position where like society's like oh I can't be the best parent but also at the same time like from my sitting his mom still sucks too Crispin horrible I wasn't too against Crispin until he started like threatening assault then I was like oh okay you were going to be a big enemy later on in the series and the fact that there's a 35 year time jump where Hadrian if when he does end up going against his family again in the future is going to be going up against like a more mature experienced version of his younger brother who's now his older brother that's ooh and I like I really like that his family wasn't the main antagonist of book one. I thought that was gonna be where book one was gonna go uh, for like the first little chunk of it that I was reading. But by the time I got like to the halfway point, I, they really couldn't smoothly fold back in his family to be the antagonist here. And so I don't know, like, I, I've had nothing spoiled for me and I'm happy about that. I don't know if his family's gonna come into play uh, soon or not, but I, I definitely feel like, okay, big combative antagonist time would be going up against Crispin again, or his father. And there are more unanswered questions. And maybe my favorite unanswered question is, yeah, his ship was shot down. I still don't know why. So his mom helped him escape being sent off to the like faux religion that's just being used to keep people in line. And he, he was put in a pod and his ship just dumped him without explanation. We never get it this book uh, on a planet. So 35 years has passed and he has to work his way up from the bottom and he ends up just like falling in love with Cat uh, in like a very, oh, this is like your first real love outside the structure of your old society way. God damn, her death, dude. It felt so dispassionate. Like, okay, it's just a disease comes along. And in like this, you know, we don't really get that built up. It just happens. But that's kind of what folds into the brutality of what Hadrian's having to live through here. Like, yeah, plague is dispassionate. Plague just kills. And uh, so, yeah, his his one friend, the only person on this planet, he literally states that he likes, dies. And he goes and takes her body and just waits it down in the water because that's all he can do for her. And, oh, God. And it was at this point where I was like, okay, where could it possibly go? I, I had nothing spoiled for me and my dumb ass didn't bother looking at the cover. You'd think I'd be like, oh yeah, gladiator story, but I just didn't do that for quite some time, I guess. And so he ends up in this fighting situation and it's very believable that he's able to do well, right? Because as we covered, he's this genetically modified, like better than people below him person. So he's able to find success. And he, uh, of course, also has training that allows him to be very Maximus, very uh, gladiator type situation here. And that's, I, I would say, another one of the things that I guess you could complain about, though so much of it is pulling from stories that are just ancient stories and other media have pulled from before, if that's gonna bother you, I, don't, I guess it could, but like, I don't know, that's so common in literature. I guess there's a huge swath of things that are just not for you. I won't like you, goodbye. But when we transition to this gladiator type setting that Hadrian finds himself in, you see the future leader that is there and this continual foreshadowing of what this historical figure that's set up at the very beginning of this book is going to be is painted all over the walls. And I love that because you see like, yeah, in many ways, Hadrian is a great leader. He's charismatic. He's able to guide people who are afraid and he is capable 
But when it comes to history and charismatic leaders who are becoming radicalized in their ideology through traumatic events, let's just say it's not a clean record and the flaws that are present within Hadrian aren't exactly going away. And so you're kind of left on this pendulum as a reader wondering what the next step for this guy is gonna be. And I love how this charismatic leader side of him does also play into his poetic angle that he even at one point now that like I mentioned in the total spoiler free halfway section that like he says he's not poetic when he clearly is. That had to be a moment of like self-awareness uh, because even later on in the book he is like, of course I'm the most extra mother I'm Hadrian. <laughs> this also comes hand in hand time and time again with his constant referrals to Gibbons, Gib Gibson, me and names, man. And that maybe overstayed its welcome a bit here in the text. I get what was trying to be done, but it was just like again and again and again and again and again. Though you could argue that that is just a part of Hadrian's characterization because yeah, he is the most dramatic protagonist I have probably read this year in a good way. I really enjoy this part of his personality where like he at one point stands up and yells at people like, I know I'm extra. Slow down drama queen. As Hadrian kind of rises up uh, and manages to, to garner you know, attention, I didn't expect his identity because he's in hiding. He doesn't want his family to know he's here because how shitty his situation is. It's better than going back to the father who's gonna like sell him off to work in a horrible religious institute where he has to be just a morally horrible thing. So I didn't think he'd end up revealing his identity, but to get out of the terrible situation he's in, he ends up revealing his identity. And yeah, then that genetics thing comes back into play where he's essentially uh, going to be used for the, the high noble on this planet's daughter uh, as a set up arranged marriage. But of course, because you need to have conflict of a sort, he starts having his own uh, blossoming romance uh, with I can't not think of her name as Dr. Vecna. That's not right. I think it's Valka. Valk. I even listened to the audiobook. This is how dyslexic I am. But I'm calling her Dr. Vecna. We're all going to have to get on board with that. <laughs> all aboard! But it's a late introduced romance. Like in the actual length of the book, it, it's not in the first, I would say, half, between third to a half of the book, but it still ended up feeling so enticing. Partially just because like, yeah, on an aesthetics level, very attractive type person that's built up for him to be into, but their chemistry also works. And intelligently, her position, her ideology, her way of viewing things does conflict with the old Hadrian. So it acts as a way to enhance his evolution, his growth as a character. So we as the reader are wanting him to more fall in love with the doctor because yeah, that's the path we want him to go down. And we're immediately loving her. She's fucking badass with her like witchy tech aesthetic and everything. And like, you know, the, the, they can't actually talk about what their evolving beliefs are until like there's like a brief moment where they're not being watched by the camera was everywhere. Uh, love that little paranoia element, that tinge of just, oh, everyone's being watched always. Big brother, mother fucker. So by the time we end up going into these ancient ruins and the contradiction to the doctrine of what is preached by the empire, the manifest as destiny like idea of humankind, just thinking that we are the best, which like, let's be honest, we have a massive ego as a species. Humanity's ego is off the goddamn charts, so it feels very believable that like this would be what is preached. And as evidence of contradicting that gets folded into play, it's like the final kick in the ass of Hadrian, where we know, okay, this narrative device that's been laid over everything of him like recounting how he's been set up to be like one of the most important people of history, you see the actual launch pad trajectory set. And then the conflict with the aliens comes into play and his ability with language folds in so nicely to make that like uber compelling as well, where the ending of Empire of Silence feels very like hopeful, very like happy. You're like, oh yeah, we're, we're set up for a good fun mission here. But in the back of my head, there's this voice going, everyone's gonna die. We're all gonna die. It has a surprisingly happy ending where like he through political maneuvering, which Hadrian has been very good at this entire story. He's almost Mary Sue-esque. Cause like, yeah, he's genetically superior. He's educated, he's trained in politics, but it's all so well justified. And the conflicts he's dealing with are so intense that he never feels Mary Sue-esque, especially cause he is dealing with loss. He does fail. He is outplayed at times, but at the end, 
he succeeds. And he's able to say, like, I want my gladiator buddies to come with me. I want the girl that is so hot and I'm so into to be here, too. And I want to have my own mission where we're going to try and, you know, work past war. We're going to get through, bring along the alien prisoners and negotiate despite the awful torture and abuse of the alien he had to be a part of that caused such internal conflict with him. I, oh, that was so great, where he's the one person who can be in the position he's in to do what he's gotta do, and he does get forced to lie, he does get forced to manipulate, but it like, it sours his gut, he hates it. Oh! Gee, now I don't feel so good. Like, they believed him. They believed what he was saying in the specific line of, like, it's not my war, it's just what I've inherited, just like you. I wanted to believe, like, I was like, yeah, okay, oh, no, not the torture, God! F but getting back into Hadrian's characterization here for a moment, if you'll allow me, and how it ties into this alien conflict, his line, how he gets the aliens to surrender, and his ability with rhetoric, like, Hadrian can manipulate. That is shown time and time again in this story. Whether he really wants to or not, he, he can do it without his heart even in it. He is someone who understands how to use words uh, to get what he wants, which is a real thing in the world. There are people who are just man master manipulators, whether they're just kind of sociopaths who don't care that they can manipulate this way, or those that have trained to be able to do this. And it's a part of their arsenal. Uh, Hadrian brings it into play, and you it, it's it's part of that thing that makes you feel so dreaded about his future because he plays with other people, not always with the most thorough follow through in terms of his thought process of what this could lead to. He's a very in the moment thinker. That kind of powerful in the moment thinker getting positioned like Hadrian is with the greater context of what this story is, like, I just feel like there are sticks of dynamite being shoved under my, uh, my reading chair right now. And he has so many flaws, like his jealousy when it comes to uh, Vecna, uh, it's having like using one of like the the lovers that's just available here within society. I like I get it like he's younger than me. I definitely had my jealousy phase and I would say he actually handled that jealousy better than I thought he would uh, when it was introduced. He, he manages to kind of overcome it. I mean, there's certainly characters that would handle it far worse than him. And it again keeps him in that likability range like he's not lashing out or trying to be venomous and he even thinks to himself like, hey, you know, I probably would have done this at some point if I had thought to just summon one of the pleasure servants, which that's a whole fucked up side of society. <sighs> He's complex. Hadrian refuses to be pinned down as like shallow or deep. Like he's got really interesting angles to his personality that make him feel very human while certainly elevated. And my end, my end thought here for Hadrian as a character is he is very dangerous. He is he is aware that he's the main character of his story, almost, it feels like, because he is so charismatic and he is able to get what he wants despite powerful people sometimes being able to maneuver well against him. Um, but he feels like one of these people who, like, yeah, is destined for greatness and standing in his way isn't going to be the easiest thing. It just feels like Hadrian's ambition is so great, and his ideas are going to become more solid, his motivations, his beliefs, and that certainly could lead to great tragedy for the galaxy. I mean, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? And Hadrian is a character, I'm not sure if he's going to be having that greater thought, that wider long-term planning that I feel like was one of his father's strengths uh, that he has yet to show is truly one of his strong suits as a character. I feel like if there is some way that he's going to be undercut in the future, it's gonna be because he kind of has that always in the moment, able to turn on a dime uh, type of planning and maneuvering but you can only survive on that so long, especially in a war or a conflict as expansive as a galaxy. But maybe he'll grow, maybe he'll change. I'm looking forward to that. If you had told me on paper how much Empire Silence did in its page count, I wouldn't have thought it could do as much as it tried to its ambition uh, thoroughly. But yeah, there are some things that jump by a bit quickly, but I feel that camaraderie, that that brothership and the gladiator time. I feel the tragedy of a quick romance. I feel the build and tension of the politics. I feel the betrayal and subversion at the beginning. Ah, oh, and th this is the worst one. It just gets better from here. God. Damn. I love that we're set up 
it feels like for like a Star Wars moment, right? They're all piling in the ship. He's like, I got my buddies, switches here, fist bump, let's go. But because of the broader narrative, the meta of everything set up, that is also like dread. <laughs> also, I'm like, uh-oh, I think you're gonna die. I think you're gonna die. That's not gonna go well. And you see clearly the flaws of Hadrian still as a leader. He might be ideologically set down a path that the reader can largely agree with, right? Like we see what the Empire's doing. We're not a fan of them. But at the same time, Hadrian's still a fool. He's still got an ego. He's still very self-confident in a way where the death of the, the torture, the torment of what's to come. I know I'm going to continue to love, hate Hadrian. And if you make me love, hate a protagonist, even as they're growing and getting into a better position, that's a nine out of 10 at least. I love it. I'm so happy. I'm going to be immediately reading the next book. Read along with me if you want. I'll have a link to check out the book for yourself down below and hit up danielbgreen.com if you want to check out any Goblin merch. Thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this read along. Like and subscribe if you have not already. And uh, I love y'all. Bye.